Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very sorry I did make us all start late today. I brought a Mac and, um, <laughs> as usual, that caused problems. But the tech guys have been very kind and um, worked hard and fixed it all up. So, I heard an interesting thing. About three weekends ago, or maybe four now, I was walking and planning. I like to go for a walk in the mornings and plan and think about things. And a dad rode by on a bike with a boy, a little boy, and I overheard some of their conversation. And the boy said, did anyone eat a cockroach before? And the dad said, yep. And the boy said, did they like it? And the dad said, sure they didn't, mate. And that was fantastic. And then I couldn't hear the rest of the conversation because I was looking a bit weird following them so closely and taking notes. <laughs> but it struck me that that was pretty much a perfect conversation for a dad to have with a child. That's sort of learning at its purest. We're animals and that's sort of how we initially learn from our parents, I think. There's, parents just become teachers, I think, without thinking. I couldn't think of better answers to those questions, and I really love that exchange. I think really young children ask questions none of us ever think to ask, because they're so curious and they're trying to understand everything, and they take nothing for granted. And as a parent or a teacher, it's a challenge to know how to answer their questions. Um, I, I love this answer because there's so many things happening at so many levels. I can't quite convey the tone of what the dad was saying, but in the way he said, yeah, it didn't suggest that it was a stupid question. It suggested he was taking it seriously and answering it and giving some thought about what the child had asked. And that was nice, because just with a slightly different tone, he could have stopped the child asking questions like that. And then, when the boy asked, did they like it? The way he answered the question sort of suggested that he was confident what the answer was, but his basis was just being sure, like he was guessing, so he sort of indicated there was some doubt and uncertainty. Um, but he gave some value to the answer, you know, how confident he was. And, I don't know, just the way he did it to me. I just wished I could have heard the rest of their conversation as I went on. And I thought, what a great dad to have. Uh, I think that boy could ask any question and the dad would simultaneously encourage him and tell him useful things. So, I think we're starting a conference now. We're going to be talking a lot about learning and teaching and course design and students so, and teachers. I think it's just really good, and what I always try and do when I'm about to start a course, is to go back to the beginning and think, before I start, what's all this about? What am I trying to achieve? What are the objectives here? What are we doing? So I just want to, if you'll bear with me, just go back a bit to some of these more fundamental questions about teaching and university and perhaps even what it is to be a person. Because I think if you go back and ask the right questions, you sometimes end up in a different spot than if you start with what you were doing last night and try and do the next step today. So, um, I think the most important thing about being a teacher and a, te uh, a learning designer is the ability to notice what's significant and respond to that. Um, I find that in any situation, normally the answer is, in fact, evident and in plain view. But there's so many things evident in plain view, it's sometimes hard to spot what is the most significant thing. And as a parent, I notice that in tricky situations. Often that night, I'll look back and think about what I did during the day, and I'll think, oh, when he said that, he really meant this, and he was actually asking for help, and he's a bit sad, and I should have said that, but I was, and I just notice, thinking about the day, often by chatting with my wife, what the most important things were, and the things that I got, and the things that I missed. So, um, let, let's start with an exercise. If I move away from the mic, how is it at the back? It's okay. It might even be a stick mic. How's it? Oh. Yeah, sorry. So a friend of, uh, a student of mine, who, who is also a friend, uh, was in Japan recently. He's from Japan. And he was telling me a story um, that some of his friends told him. That uh, a bit more than a month ago, they got a text message on their phone saying, um, a nuclear missile launch from Korea detected, uh, path passes over Tokyo or wherever, you have five minutes. 
and he said, everyone was shocked. Everyone got this message, and that was that launch. You remember New, uh, North Korea did this launch, but it was a test fire, and it went over Japan, didn't land on Japan, but they had no way of knowing at that time. So everyone on the network got a, a five-minute warning. And I want you to imagine that you just got a text message saying that. Perhaps you're in Japan, and you know the tensions with North Korea. You've got five minutes. What are you going to do? Five minutes. So now just think, talk to the person next to you, plan. Five minutes, go. I won't literally give you five minutes. I've got one minute to plan, four minutes to carry back. Just someone, put up your hand if your table had an interesting answer. What would you do? Someone from this table. Five minutes. Someone from this table. Anyone? Post it on social media. <laughs> You're helping future archaeologists. That's fantastic. If only like the ancient Greeks and uh, Romans had been so kind and documented everything they did. Um, yep, that's a, that's a, well I won't go so far as saying that's a good answer, though the teacher inside me wants to say that. That's certainly an answer. Well done for answering the question. <laughs> Why social media? Ah. So actually that is a good answer. So, are you saying in a way society is acting as a mechanism to send, to communicate? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, that is a, that's a really good answer. Yeah, okay, good, I hadn't thought of that. You guys, what did you have? I think we went with personal answers. Yes. Oh, so assuming it's all going to end, how do you have a good ending? Bring someone up and apologize, or? Yes. A glass of wine. <laughs> Actually, you're reminding me, there is a film called The Day the Earth's Caught Fire. It's a very old film. Do you know that film? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Do, do you want to say something about that? No, no, no. Anyway, everyone should watch it. It is a great film where people briefly know that possibly the world will end very soon, and you, you watch how they act. Okay, so, yep, there's some things more, different sorts of answers from anyone. Yep? Did you just get this message? <laughs> yes, it could be. Could be David Collian actually just sending you a silly message. Yes. Say again. Yeah, how do you know the message is true? How do you authenticate that message? So, can I say, in my security course, when I'm training students to be security engineers, the trick to being a security engineer, I think, isn't knowing how to hack, though you need to know how to hack, and it isn't knowing a whole lot of cryptography, though you need to know a reasonable amount of cryptography, enough to make sensible decisions. And it's not about knowing a litany of all the different exploits that have ever been there, though that's all useful information to have. I think the real trick to being a security engineer is given a situation, you can rapidly identify what are the key parts of that situation. Because security, especially com computer security, is this rapidly changing thing where there are a million things going on at any instant. There are so many problems and weaknesses and vulnerabilities surrounding you at all times. And you don't have enough resources or, or a bandwidth to deal with them all. So the trick really is looking at any situation with what I call security engineering eyes and scoping out what are the key factors, what are the most significant things you need to spot. This skill again of noticing what's significant. So we actually in that class to train security engineers every week, we start with a scenario where we give them a case study and we say, what would you do? What do you think? And then they work in teams and debate. And we don't tell them the answer and often there is, well, actually always probably there is no right answer. And they debate, we're using the Harvard case method. And they, 
argue with each other and debate, and then they work out a collective answer in their groups, and then they meet with larger groups, and everyone presents their answer, and they work out, and then ultimately we get a tutorial level answer. But all the tutorials have different answers. But the interesting thing is for them as they go through this process, they learn a sort of humility, which is no matter how good their first reaction is, and no matter how good their ideas are, when they discuss with others, ideas from completely different angles suddenly appear and you think about the situation very differently. Um, and so actually I think it's a really concrete way of learning people to trust others and to seek um, the opinion of others, which is actually something else that's important in security engineering. This is one of, um, this is related to one of the case studies I run. We normally do a tsunami case study. So there's a tsunami coming, what do you do? And we look at actual tsunamis that have come and the different behaviours of various people. We look at the Twin Towers when the plane collided and the different courses of action and the different ways the different people responded and who survived and who didn't and so forth. We look at these actual real situations because I think in a real situation you have this sharpened sense that what you're talking about is real and has some bearing in the world that can impact your life and it's worth investing your time and energy in thinking about it. You're not doing it to pass a test or get a certificate at the end. You're actually doing it because you suddenly realise you don't have the skill to answer this question off the top of your head and you wish you did because that would make you a better person or a better engineer or more useful course. So they then have a longing, I think, to learn the, me the mechanisms and frameworks and ways we go about teaching them how to think. Uh, and uh, will have to uh, tease out their thinking to become better engineers. So if we can apply those same skills, that same stepping back thinking, scoping the whole situation, it's a big mess, and trying to work out what's most significant, can we just actually apply that to ourselves, to education? Um, there's a million things on, you've got exams to mark, there are deadlines, you've got to get promoted, you've got to write papers, you've got colleagues, you've got students, you've got complaints, you've got problems, you've got this and that. There's so many things happening around you at all instances. If you're a leader, you've got various teams who are trying to do things, you've got budgets, you've got KPIs. Amidst that sea of things clamouring for your attention, I think the most important and the most effective educator is one who can look across all these factors and suddenly decide these four things, or these two things, or whatever they are, are the most significant. This, I cannot let this go, I need to think about that. So if we think about what should teaching be, what should education be, and what should a university be, um, I, so we have a workshop after this, and we'll have lots of interaction with you guys in the workshop. Because I started a bit late, maybe I won't ask you, maybe mentally you can answer that question now. But maybe to save time, we'll just move through it. Just think what you think the answer to those questions are. I'll tell you why. I think teaching is like that dad. I think teaching is the act of finding, working with someone who wants to, a student, who wants to change in some way and then helping them change. I don't think teaching is explaining. And I've been to lots of talks recently where people talk about good teachers and bad teachers, and I'm often on panels looking at teaching awards and prizes and working out who, who gets and who gets promoted, or not who gets promoted, who gets employed or whatever. These decisions where people have to make decisions about teachers. And often, the things that people applying for the prize or whatever say is they describe how good they are at explaining things. And I think explaining is such a small part of being a teacher, and it's not even really that important a part these days, in that if you explain something badly, I bet there's someone on the internet who explains it better, and the students can find it by Googling in five or ten seconds, if they want to, and if you give them a thirst and they do go out and go to that trouble to search. So teaching for me is a sort of facilitation. What should education be? Well, I have... I have a friend who works in robotics, and he showed me the factories where they make cars using robots. And it's amazing to see, I have a little video at the end, if we have a bit of time, I'll show you, but it probably won't because I stuffed this around at the beginning. But to watch these robots build the cars is just breathtaking. It's almost like ballet and machinery. But watching it is also quite concerning, because it makes me think, these used to be jobs done by people. And it, becoming increasingly obvious that anything that can be automated, that just involves being able to do something or know something or say something or calculate something or work something out, those sorts of jobs are so easy to automate that depending on the price of labour and the price of building a robot, both of with which are moving in bad directions, you know, counterwise directions, 
ultimately, I don't think that's the way of the future for mankind or for people or for my students or for jobs. I think what education should be, what universities should be doing, is preparing our students for the future. And it's not a future where you're going to do something that a robot can do, hopefully. It's a future where you make the world a better place, where we see the potential of mankind, where we go to other planets, where we help people, where we're kind, where we do all sorts of sort of excellent, continue the experiment that began with, um, uh, in the, uh, oh, suddenly got blank, uh, the French thing. Enlighten, continue the enlightenment experiment, continue the thing to work out what, what man can do. Yeah, 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 the enlightenment, like it's sort of a bit French. I mean, we all, we all love enlightenment, but you know, Voltaire and those guys, I love them. And their idea was, what, what can man be? We're not just here to be serfs to, for a master and to make more money for our boss and to help the king and things like that. Mankind has this sort of mission to understand the universe, to understand ourselves looking in and to build a good society where people are treated fairly and live fulfilling lives. I think it's a wonderful experiment and it's still going on. So here's my picture of what I think a university should be. Here's a student coming along. He's at high school. He's got a backpack. He's just a student, though he does seem to have a beard high school student with a beard, he walks along, and at the end here, he's off in society doing something. I mean, he's got a suit, but he doesn't have to be doing a suit. He could be a dad, he could be a bricklayer, it could be anything. But somehow he changes in the middle here, where I put all the question marks, from being a student to being an adult, from being someone being trained for society to being someone who's in society and causing society and empowering society. And the question mark for me is teaching. That's what a university is. That's, what we, that's where we're living. How do we change these people? How do we transform them? So for me, education is a transformation. It's not a matter of teaching someone some knowledge, though that could be part of it. It's a matter of changing someone. And I want to talk about uh, education in the, in the point of view of a bricklayer. And you might know the famous story about the three bricklayers, but if you don't, uh, I'm glad to be able to tell you for the first time. If you do, you can enjoy it again. It's a great story. It's not mine. Someone told me. This guy's walking along and meets three bricklayers by the side of the road. Does anyone know this story? No? Oh, maybe it's new for you all. How excellent. Um, and he says to one of the bricklayers, what are you doing? And the bricklayer says, well, I'm putting cement on this brick, and I'm putting it on other bricks, and then I'm cleaning the cement off, and I'm making them square. And I'm just doing that repeatedly. And he said to the next bricklayer, what are you doing? And the next bricklayer said, I'm building a wall. And he said, oh. And he said to the third bricklayer, what are you doing? And he said, I'm constructing a cathedral. And of course, all three bricklayers were saying the truth, but there are different levels of abstraction. They have different views of what they're doing. So in this talk, I'm just starting with a bit of the cathedral stuff. Like, where are we actually going? What are we doing? And then, towards the end of the conference, and certainly in the workshop that we'll be running immediately after this, we'll get a bit more down to the brick level. You know, how do you actually assemble the bricks? But I think it's really important to work out up front where we're heading and what it's all about and what the big picture is. Or we might end up laying the bricks perfectly, but constructing something horrible. So, um, my job at UNSW is a funny one. Um, as, as well as teaching cybersecurity, I've got this other job called the Director of First Year Experience. And what that means is sort of managing the experience and looking after and understanding the experience of the students as they come into university and as they move through their whole first year. And this year, as part of that job, I've mainly been gathering information. I've been following students, recording them. Again, that's a little bit creepy thing. Um, recording them, tracking them, giving them GoPros, having lots of interviews all the time, just listening, trying not to speak, but trying just to listen, and hearing hundreds and hundreds of student stories and observing, and walking around the uni and trying to see it with fresh eyes. And I've noticed a couple of things, and here are the two main things that have come out of all this research. First of all, we have a very brief window of opportunity that when the students come into the university and start something new, they're prepared for university to be anything. They're prepared for their education to be anything. They're open to everything and they're excited. But by the end of the first semester, they've lost heart, they've fixed their attitudes, they're rechanging their timetables so they turn up as little as possible and have as many free days as possible. And they've lowered their expectations for what university, in many cases, what university will do for them. From thinking this will be something that changes my life and is this dream that I've aspired to all my life to, oh, well, this is just like school again. At the end, I'll get a certificate. So there's this narrow opportunity, I think, which is their first course, uh, the first time they're at university, that we have to give them a different set of expectations and create the way they think. So I think the way we start is the most important thing. 
And then the second thing I've noticed is that when I looked at the whole university and all the things we did and interviewed all the staff and looked at our syllabus and our curriculums and our research and all the things that the university had, it became very clear that our students themselves were the biggest asset the university had, the biggest resource the university had. And rather than viewing them as a problem or as a series of customers or things we have to deal with or something like that, if we view them instead as part of the process, part of the family, and we draw on them, then the university can become incredibly powerful and incredibly effective. So this leads to, I guess, what we're talking about today, which is social learning. Somehow putting the student's centre and saying that university is not about one teacher teaching 500 students, which is very difficult, or one teacher teaching and managing 800 students, which is even more difficult. It's about 501 teachers teaching 501 students, or 801 teachers teaching 801 students. When everyone works together and helps each other, suddenly what previously looked like a problem suddenly becomes an asset. On the weekend, my little brother had a birthday party for his youngest son. And they ran around shooting Nerf guns at each other. I don't know if anyone's seen a Nerf gun. Does anyone you know what a Nerf gun is? Yeah. It's like a pistol or a machine gun that fires little pellets of foam rubber that are innocent and harmless, but you are pointing people. It was strangely satisfying, actually, to shoot little children. I thought, I had to keep telling me to stop playing. But, they had a guy there who had hundreds of Nerf guns and hundreds of Nerf bullets and we had an incredible afternoon just running around shouting and shooting, 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 shooting. It was a bit weird and disturbing. Let's not worry about that. The important thing was, at the end, I thought, that was so much fun, but I feel really sorry for this guy that organised the day because the whole park that was covered with just Nerf bullets everywhere and they're quite expensive. I thought, I bet he has to factor in something like two or three hours at the end of every job to just go around picking up all the bullets. And I asked him what his wastage was, and he said 5%. And I thought, well, he's doing quite a good job then if he can get 95% of the bullets back. That's, that's actually a lot of work. So when the thing was about to finish, he said, right, guys, last game. And what did he say? Yeah, he said, pick up the bullets. Whoever gets the most bullets gets something. And he had some prize or something. I don't know what it was. And the kids ran around, and suddenly they were all picking up the bullets. And he was just lying back, stretching out. <laughs> and it took them about 20 minutes rather than two hours, that I thought. And they came back with so many, and they found them everywhere, and they were just had this great time, and it was fantastic. For me, that is social learning. That's the mechanism that we're aiming to exploit with all of this. That if our students are part of it, along with us, not that we're lazy and we want to lie on a couch and not do any work, but the amount of work we've got to do at a teacher's is pretty unimaginable. It's pretty breathtaking. My wife used to accuse me of having an affair with my teaching because I'd spend more time working with my students in my class than I did with my wife. That's not sustainable, especially as classes get bigger. But if we take this social approach, suddenly it becomes sustainable because amongst every class we have students who are better at everything you want to imagine than you are. We need someone to draw a picture, I've got a student who can do it better. We need someone to think of a good analogy to cover this point, we just say to the class, who can think of a good analogy? And someone will stick their hand up, especially if there's 500 in the class, you'll get a better example than you could have ever thought of yourself. So this is, I guess, the power of social. We're seeing it in Facebook and we're seeing it, I guess, transforming online, which is changing from a one-to-one -one or a one-to-look-up sort of world to now to a network world. And it's so addictive, just for social pleasure, that when we do it for fun, it keeps going. But in teaching, we can use the same mechanism to improve the quality of our teaching. <laughs> Does anyone know what this picture is? Does anyone? What's that? It's a Coke bottle. Well done. Just before they inflate it. That's a two-liter bottle. For me, it's a two-liter bottle before it's inflated. How did you know? <laughs> well done, that's fantastic. For me, this is our students, this is the potential we've got. That's a two little bottle. We can leave it as a little thing like that all the time. Your students can sit in your class and they can just sit there passively and you can teach them stuff and sure. If you want, that's what you can do. Or you can realise their full potential as participants in the whole learning process and the power of the community in the whole learning process. And then you get the two little bottles. And you can't really imagine how wonderful and big the two little bottles are when you see these little things. But you know, astonishing. And the last observation I wanted to make 
um, about what, we've, uh, what I've noticed in the first year experience analysis I've done this year is how easy it is to fool myself. I'm constantly fooling myself. As a lecturer, I used to think my courses were going well because the students I could see sitting in the front, like these goody goodies here in this table, <laughs> and you go in. They're all happy. But they're sitting in the front. I need to look past the ones that are sitting in the front and see the ones at the back who are bored or playing on their things or the ones that haven't even come. It's just very easy. It's confirmation bias. We know it in science. We know it in our academic work. Over and over again, to be a scholar, when we do our research, we question everything we do and we get everything peer-reviewed. Not to get pats on the back, but so people can tell us what's wrong about it and what we've overlooked and what we've missed. Really, it is part of being a scholar and a professional to be self-critical and to to analyze and be a bit brutal with your practice. But as a teacher, it's so easy not to do that. It's so easy to fool ourselves. I sometimes think this. When someone is applying for some sort of teaching award, that here's what a typical application looks like. I did this, it's really good. 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 Okay. If my students tried to hand a portfolio in like that, what would I say? Has any, uh, any, anyone here been one of my students with a portfolio? <laughs> oh. Evidence? Evidence, yeah. We get everyone to say, oh, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear to you, so I'll say, um, <laughs> Bull shoes, the shoes of the bull pegs. I train my markers to every time someone hands me in a portfolio and makes a claim, we all shout, bull shoes! <laughs> Which is an Australian phrase, if you're not from Australia, meaning, I doubt the veracity of that. <laughs> I think you might be making that up. Um, so we get the students to practice their portfolios and to make claims, and whenever they make claims, we tell them, the person marking your claim is a former student <coughs> just like you, but a year older. And you will try and trick them and make all sorts of claims that aren't really true. And they will look at it and see right through you and instantly run it through their head. Every time you make a claim will be rubbish. I don't think that's true. Rubbish, rubbish, rubbish. And sometimes I even mark portfolios in front of the students and I just put them on the screen while they're doing something and I just move through them and I mark them like rubbish, 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 rubbish. Because what every portfolio needs is claim and then someone said it before. Evidence. Evidence. If you're applying for a job, you'd say I'm the best shoe polisher in the world if you want a shoe polishing job. That's not going to get you the job, but if you give some evidence to back it up. I won the best shoe polisher in the world competition three years in a row. My shoe polishing videos on YouTube did this and that. And my customers come back. Here's what someone said to me the other day. Suddenly, it's a credible claim. So I think as teachers, we expect that from our students when they submit portfolios. But I don't know that we apply the same level. I don't either to myself. So how I think it should go is someone should say, I did this really good thing, it's really good evidence. And the evidence isn't evidence to support what you're saying. If you're a scholar, if you're an academic, the evidence is trying really hard to show what you're thinking is wrong. A scholar proves themselves wrong. He's constantly trying to prove ourselves wrong. Someone who's trying to pull the proof themselves right is a politician or a marketing person. <laughs> they don't belong at a university. That's fine, they can do their job, that's fine. But our job should be constantly trying to prove ourselves wrong. And I think our teaching practice is, I think, largely not sufficiently reflective. So here's what I wanted to say about that, and then how am I going for time, Sarah? Uh, you've got 10 minutes. Perfect, alright. So, here's what I, I repeat the microphone. I just wanted to say that because we were criticising teachers, suddenly it felt a bit confidential. So <laughs> <laughs> but can I say, I'm criticising myself as much as anyone. It's very easy. We see this over and over again in all research. It's human nature to find yourself right, to surround yourself with people that agree to you, to think of excuses for erroneous data rather than be alarmed by uh, you know, inconsistent data. It's just in our nature to want to believe that everything we're doing is good. It's really hard.
to question yourself. So I'm a mathematician. <coughs> Mathematics works like this. There is this imaginary place where mathematics lives. It's like a platonic idea. It's the ultimate platonic idea. You know, Plato talked about this series of ideals, and then in the real world we have sort of imperfect copies or manifestations of the ideals. So in maths, everything lives in this ideal place. And we can prove things in this ideal place. I don't know any other disciplines that are really like that. Most other disciplines like science, we're in the actual world. And it's a real world with real things happening. And we form theories and then we test them out in the real world. So in a sense, although maths and science might look similar, to me, science has constantly been about trying to explain the real world. Maths is just trying to explain the world that arises from a series of really beautiful axioms that we sort of by social contracts that more or less occur. So maths, mathematicians are lucky. We never really have to move anything back to the real world, but everyone else does. Now here's how I think teaching practice normally goes. We live in this imaginary place that I like to call dreamland. And we imagine how good our class is. And we imagine how effective all the things we do are. And if we've just done something, we imagine how excellent it was. And we imagine how much the students like it. We imagine how good it's going to be. And I think to move to the next level as a teacher, what we need to do is then leave that imaginary place and see, but how actually is it? So there was a famous hospital in England where the doctors noticed that despite the hospital seeming to be fantastic, the patients were very sick and often people stayed sick longer if they were in hospital than if they went home and tried to heal at home. And they said, that's weird. And they wondered why the hospital wasn't really doing its job. And one of the doctors, a surgeon, who's really clever, said, I wonder what it's like to actually be a patient. So he lay, he just spent a day being a patient at, at the hospital. He lay on a, one of the gurneys when they pushed people around and he was actually wheeled along the corridor to go into surgery and then he noticed the orderlies leave you and go off and chat amongst themselves and he just abandoned at the end of this corridor for a little while. And he, he just tried to live the experience of being a patient in the hospital. And his conclusion was that hospitals are designed for doctors and patients are a slight inconvenience in the hospital. And, and many people have said that since. And I sort of think, in a way, maybe unis can be, have a temptation to be like that too. That we're, they're really here for us, and the students are slightly convenient. The thing I want to tell you about this guy, the surgeon, was he did this most beautiful thing. He was lying in the gurney looking up, and he noticed that the roof of the corridor was disgusting. <laughs> it had mold on it, and the paint was cracking, and it just had different patches on it, and there were pipes, and it was just horrible. And he was laying there going into surgery, watching this disgusting, dirty looking roof above him. And just feeling really not very happy. But when he stood up and he was a doctor again, he never sees it. You don't look up when you're a doctor, you're not lying in the gurney. The doctors and the patients had completely different views of the hospital. So the first thing he did was then he got um, a whole lot of famous artists to come in and they painted beautiful murals on all the ceilings, made the ceilings all beautiful and nice. I sort of think that's what we need to do with education. We somehow need to see education through the eyes of our students and their community. And we need to then make it work for them. Not for us in our dreamland. In our dreamland, everything's perfect. But our dreamland is not what's actually happening. So I've got some examples from dreamland, and I think we've got a little bit of time. First of all, um, Mira Kim, who's a lovely teacher at this uni, um, she noticed that some of her translation students, so she teaches translation languages, and she has people that want to be translators coming here to learn how to be translators as a career. And she noticed that a lot of the overseas students she was getting to come here to be translators, say someone from China who wanted to be a Chinese English translator, would come here, but their English wasn't as good as you would think it should be to be a Chinese English translator. And they would get depressed, and they would fail, and they would drop out. And she noticed this was a prevalent pattern year after year. So she started interviewing them and chatting to them. And she found apparently what happened was they'd turn up and they'd find their language wasn't as good as they thought it would be. And they would talk in the class, and other people wouldn't really understand them and would look a bit scornful, and they'd start shutting up because they didn't want to lose face. And they started to withdraw, and then they started sitting at the back of the class, and they stopped saying anything at all. And sometimes they would just hide in their room at home and not come into uni at all. And they felt sick inside, and they felt ashamed of themselves, and they felt they were letting themselves down. They weren't blaming anyone else, but the net result is that they just left and they had a trouble time. She thought, really, it's just about their managing their emotional state and their relationship with the university.
they weren't feeling part of a community at the university, they were feeling as an individual and really inadequate. So she arranged for them this course they would do, which was pass by. Actually, initially it wasn't even worth any marks at all. It wasn't even an official course. But they would turn up and she would get them to say a project, which was a personal challenge for them, something they wanted to achieve. And then she would pair them up with a mentor, and that mentor would help them achieve their challenge. They would make a couple of presentations along the way of the, their challenge. And their challenge could be a small thing like, I want to talk in class. I want, I want to be able to stand up and give a presentation. I want to answer some questions. Or I want to be able to go down to the shops and order, and go into a non-Chinese shop and order a meal at a restaurant and, and do it in English or something. And then they would, she would work on the challenge with them. And then at the end, everyone would present how they went with their challenges. And everyone would support each other and uplift each other. The students all universally reported this was the best thing that happened to them at university, although it didn't look so academic, it changed their attitudes towards university, their confidence and everything, and the students started succeeding and doing well in their courses and their studies. The particularly beautiful thing she did, which I really loved, and I wish I had footage of it to show you, I did shoot it, but I just haven't got permission from everyone involved in it to show you, but she has this thing called the singing club, and once a week, the students, if they want, can turn up to this voluntary class on a Friday, where she's booked out a big room, they sit around with guitars, I've sat in there, it's so moving, I actually cried the first time we had to sort of turn away from them so I can see it. And they just sing lovely songs, and they sing in initially broken English, and it gets better and better, and they're all just happy, and they support each other, and they nominate their favourite song, and some of them are guitarists, and various ones bring musical instruments from their home countries, and everyone sings, no matter what the confidence or sadness of their voice or whatever, and it is this most incredible uplifting time. And for many of them, it is the highlight of their week that Friday afternoon when they go to singing club. It's not anything we would measure in a multiple choice exam. As far as the university sort of thinks, it's almost invisible to us. Yet this class changed those students and helped them achieve their goals more than any other individual thing in their lives, according to the ones that I interviewed. So, I guess, this is going back to the big question, thinking what is a university? If a university is just to learn answers to questions, then we go down one path and we work out how to ask the questions more clearly and how we distribute them to a larger number of people and how we mark them more easily and how we mark them more reliably and how we stop cheating and how we make sure that the hardness this year was the same as the hardness last year. We start going down that path answering all those questions and they're okay questions to ask, but I think that's the wrong path to go down. And we could go all the way down that path and have the best answers to those questions of any university in the world. I still don't think we'd be doing our job. Because I think the real path is to think, well, what are we trying to do here? My security engineering students, I want them to have security eyes. When they have security eyes, they can do anything. And they are doing it. They're leading security at Apple and at, uh, just recently Dropbox. They're in all the major banks. They're senior figures in the police. They're in government departments we're not allowed to talk about. They're overseas at, uh, you know, at, at, in Silicon Valley doing amazing things. The students are really successful. And they are really successful despite us focusing mainly on security eyes and ways of thinking and critical thinking, rather than giving them lots of multiple choice tests. And they win hacking competitions and they're technically expert and so on and so on. So we haven't missed any of that other stuff, but we didn't make it our main focus. It sort of was a consequence of our main focus. Mirrors, what was the question she was asking? She was not asking, how do I get them to understand uh, subjunctive prepositions in English or something better or this or that. She was asking herself the question, how do they need to change to become an effective translator? And she suddenly realized they just needed confidence. Once they had confidence, then they would interact with others and natural everyday language and interacting with others, learning by doing, would actually carry them over the threshold far easier than she could if she bore them on her shoulders. And she realised in this unusual case, because this, everyone's an expert in, it, in Australia, aren't we? We can all speak English for Australia. So you've, you've not just got 801 teachers, all of society is a potential teacher for your student. So don't waste any of your time teaching in a way. I mean, you have to a bit, but tap into those resources as a teacher. Do what you need to do that's most effective to achieve what you want. Right. Um, I have a quote. I believe teaching is about making the strange familiar and the familiar strange. It's a paraphrase of a famous quote. Um, teaching and explaining, this is the thing I'm most interested in. And here's the factory. These are what your students used to do. Now it's done by robots. I'm going to conclude now. 
with a final example of community. At UNSW, the students often get stressed by their IT not working. They can't log in, they can't register, they can't do this, they can't get the password, they can't print out, they can't get their card. They... Problems all the time. Anyone, has anyone here ever used an IT system before? <laughs> As a computer scientist, on behalf of all people that write IT systems, can I apologise? And we're really sorry. Because everything we do is wrong and broken and not as good as it should be and causes so much human pain and suffering. And I'm very sorry. So here's what Anatoly's solution was. With some students, working with students, he wrote a little app called My IT Mobile. And it looks a lot like Uber. And all my taxi. And what happens is, if you have problems, you just click saying, I have a problem. Any student can use it, or anyone the staff can use it. I have a problem. And it shows you a map of where you are with a pin, and all near you, all the people, we call them the heroes, UNSW heroes, all the heroes near you are shown up on the map. And you say, I have a problem, I can't get my password working. And then it says, Bing, Andrew is coming to help. And you see a little on the map, there's and you see all the helpers around you, and there's Andrew's map, and then you see a line to him and say, ETA, two minutes. And I've been sitting with a student while they're waiting, and in two minutes this guy comes running up. He says to the student, he says, what's the problem? Which one of you is Ian? Is that your problem? Ian, I mean, I can't look. He says, oh, Ian, here we go. Oh, look, yeah, you forgot to, you have to, you know, turn it off and on again three times. Da, 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 it's working. Thank you, my work here is done. Then Andrew just jumps off. He's not paid. No one's paid. What it is, is it's a community of students all helping each other. Now, they're helping each other with IT, but there's no reason they can't help each other with learning or any other dimension of student life. It's that thing I was saying at the beginning about our students, that the participants in our courses being our biggest asset. They are so keen to help each other and work together. And working together, the outcomes that happen, it's just so inspiring to see that. When, when someone jogs up and helps you with a problem and jogs away, not expecting any payment or response or anything like that, it makes you want to be a better person. It makes you want to do that course next year and enroll and be someone that jumps around for. It makes you want to think. And for me, if we go back to cathedral, that's the cathedral of learning. That's sort of how I want it to be. In my family, with my children, their dad, with the boy, learning works best when it's surrounded by love and personal bonds and support. I know we have to teach in an industrial world with large classes and everyone locks step and we've moved away from that family model. But maybe, just maybe, IT gives us now the ability to, even at scale, have families again in education. So thank you very much.